Hi everybody, welcome to this week's Kefir 30. Uh, that's right, our Kefir 30 is a 30 minute Bible study and this week we'll be covering the Torah portion called Vay Eshkalach, which means and he sent and the chapters will be Genesis 32 through 36. So grab your Bibles, open them up, and let's take a look at what God might have for each one of us today in his word. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. What a gift. Thank you that it, it sheds light on our path, that we know where to go. We know who you are because of your word. And we know what your will is for our lives because of your word. We just thank you for what a gift it is to us and give us the strength and the courage and fill us with your spirit today that we might walk in your ways. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Jacob. You know, yeah, I have a lot of mixed feelings about Jacob, but in this chapter... Um, my thoughts are of a man who represents spiritual strength, the ability to move forward and to continue in spite of all the obstacles of his life journey. His life was not easy. He was manipulative. He was um, a schemer. He, we're gonna find that he wrestles with God, he's a compromiser, uh, you name it, he's a, a real down-to-earth type of guy. And we're able to see the path that God takes him down and taking him from being that heel grabber, Jacob, and transforming him at the end of his life into Israel. So, um, let's recap real quick. Uh, make sure you grab the PDF PowerPoint. Um, it's part of the link that you can get from the YouTube, or you can go to our website at holygroundexplorations.com and grab it. It really does accompany this 30-minute study. And as you know, uh, I also include comments by those that comment uh, in our weekly Kefir Bible readings. Uh, Andrew, Glenn, Sharon, and Troy. You'll see comments from them. Sometimes I don't have enough time in our 30 minutes to get through it all, but it's all in that PDF PowerPoint, which is another reason for you to grab it. Okay, this chapter is going to, we're just going to entitle it Wrestling with God, Jacob's Journey. And, you know, in the first slide, you're going to see a, a map. I just wanted you to get a glimpse of Haran. Uh, that's where Jacob is going to leave from, leaves Laban. And then he's going to make his way to um, Peniel. This is where he's going to wrestle with God. This is that area that he's going to um, meet Esau. And then I want you to see where Esau is going to go to in Seir or to Edom. And where Jacob goes to in terms of Shechem and then Bethel. So uh, again, the map is just to kind of catch you up. And so let's uh, get our Bibles open uh, again. As you know, I don't have enough time to do verse by verse all the way through all of these. So I've sort of picked out uh, the things that spoke to me and will give you sort of my comments on those things. So chapter 32, verse 3, uh, Jacob sent messengers in front of him to Esau, his brother, to the land of Seir, the field of Edom. And he commanded them saying, this is what you shall tell my Lord Esau. This is what your servant Jacob says. I have lived as a foreigner with Laban and stayed until now. I have cattle, donkeys, flocks, male servants, female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord that I might find favor in your sight. 
Again, note these terms. Uh, my Lord, this is your servant, and I've sent these things to you in order that I might find favor. Uh, this is not uh, Jacob lording over Esau saying, I now have the birthright, I'm coming back. No, 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 that's not what's happening. Notice, by the way, in verse 6, what follows says the messengers that were sent out returned to Jacob saying, we have come to your brother. We came to your brother Esau. He's coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. And then verse 7 kind of states the mood. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Now, there's a lot of the sages talk a lot about Esau. And uh, so we're going to weave in and out of some of their thoughts as well. But the Midrash states that Esau actually named the place that he was living Seir. Now in Hebrew, that means goat. And the sages say that he named it that to remind him of how his brother wore the skin of goats when, goats when he stole his blessing by tricking Isaac into blessing him. So it's like a, a conscious reminder of that schemer. I live in goat. Yeah, I remember Jacob. Now, these terms, by the way, in verse 7, greatly afraid and distressed, in the Hebrew, these terms refer to terror and fright. Spurgeon, I'll give you a Spurgeon quote. Jacob had just been delivered from Laban, but he was oppressed by another heavy load, mental anguish. The dread of Esau was upon him. He had wronged his brother, and you cannot do a wrong without being haunted by it afterwards. As Jacob had no strength before Esau because of that guilt, Spurgeon goes on to say, many Christians today are also hindered by the memory of their past sins and their failings and their guilt. So terror, the dread of Esau, the fear, let's see what happens next. Again, in chapter 32, verse 9, Jacob now is going to talk to Yahweh, to God. He says, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Yahweh who said to me, return to your country, to your relatives, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the loving kindness and of all the truth which you have shown to your servant. For with my just for with just my staff, I crossed over this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and strike me and the mothers and my children. You said, I will surely do you good and make your offering as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because there are so many. This is the headstrong, the getter done Jacob, who now is completely undone, dread and terror, and is completely dependent upon the Lord. Notice, he doesn't say, my God, it's the God of my father, the God of my, my grandfather. Uh, can I remind you? He's doing He's doing his best on one side with what he's offering Esau. He's trying to butter him up. He's trying to minimize the impact. But, but the bottom line is that Jacob has no confidence. These 400 men scared him witless, and now he's throwing himself before God. Please, he says in verse 11, please deliver me. Undone. Verse 24, Jacob 
when he maneuvers and sets the camps and sends the gifts, he's now crossing over the Jebek. He's now all alone and he's wrestling with a man there until the breaking of the day. Verse 25, when he saw that he didn't prevail against him, this personage that he's wrestling, the man touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was strained as he wrestled. The man said, let me go for the day breaks. And Jacob says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? He said, heel grabber, Jacob. He said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have fought with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. And he said, why is it that you ask what my name is? So he blessed him there. Now, I want you to notice as we continue to read the saga of Jacob, that both names now, Jacob and Israel, will be used interchangeably. They have different meanings. Uh, even the word Israel has two different meanings. One meaning is that it's one who struggles with God, and the other is one who is a prince with God. Now, Jacob's been struggling his whole life, right? He's that get her done, I can do it. He's thinking everything through. He, you would not say he's reliant upon God. He's bargaining. He's saying, even back at Bethel, where he saw the stairway to heaven, he's saying, now God, if you do this and this and this, then once you've done all that, then you'll be my God. He's still Jacob. But now, coming to the end of himself in this situation, and again, this struggling was in the womb, we're told. And then Laban, and now with God. So from this point on, this son of Isaac will be referred to as Jacob still twice as often as he is Israel. Apparently, there's still that old man left in Jacob. And you know what? I get that. Because on one hand, in Jesus, I know I'm victorious. I, I, I know what he's done for me. I know that I'm justified. I know that I'm being sanctified. And one day I will be glorified. But sometimes the old man, Dan has to come to grips with life. And once again, I have to throw myself like Jacob before God. And I have to tell you, being honest and sincere, sometimes in throwing yourself before God requires the same kind of wrestling match. God wants a relationship with the real you. And in order for that to happen, you have to be transparent and honest with God. Well, Jacob's going to call the name of this place Peniel, for he said, I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. And then the sun rose on him as he passed over Peniel and he limped because of his thigh. Now, Jacob now is reduced to the place where all he could do was to hold on to the Lord with everything that he had. And that's that picture. He wouldn't let go unless God blessed him. How about you? Do you have that vice grip on the Lord? Jacob could not fight anymore. All he could do was to hold on. And by the way, that's not a bad place to be. Now, Tozer, I, I love his quote as he writes about this situation, calls to mind this man that's limping. He, he, he makes the statement that make sure 
those that you choose to follow, those that are mentors and those that are, are pastor teachers in your life, make sure that they're walking with a limp. Let that sink in because a real relationship requires wrestling with God and many times we don't get the answers that we want. He doesn't do things our way. And there are times that he says, this is the way. You've probably heard this before. God answers every prayer, right? He says, yes. He says, not now. And he says, no. And sometimes in that not now and that no, it hits us and we struggle with it and we wrestle with him and he's not going to change his mind. And we're left with this limp. Nevertheless, not my will, God, but your will be done. I choose to follow you, not because you'll be this spiritual genie in my life, but I choose to follow you because of what you've done for me. You died on the cross, and if that's the only thing, it deserves my full obedience and allegiance to you. But it's a real life, and many of us are walking with visible limps these days, right? All right, um, Troy want, makes a comment about this. He says that uh, in that verse 28, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and prevailed. And he says, you know, Israel truly is a nation of people that has and continues to this day to struggle with God and with men. There's nothing easy in this world, and it's not meant to be. God builds character in us through tribulation combined with faith. To wrestle and struggle builds character. But to deny and be complacent and to whine and complain is simply laziness and quitting on yourself and those around you. Thanks, Troy. I needed to read that this week, by the way. All right, chapter 33, um, verse 1, Jacob lifts up, lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, Esau. Esau was coming and with him, the 400 men. Now, he divides the children between Leah, Rachel, and the two servants. He puts the servants and their children in front, Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph at the rear. But notice verse 3. He himself passed over in front of them, and he bows himself to the ground seven times, until he came near to his brother, and Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck, kissed him, and they wept. Notice, Jacob is not last. I think it's noteworthy that Jacob stood between Esau and his family. The man who would now walk with the limp would be standing in the gap. You know, it's the Israeli IDF way. Leaders are out front leading. They're not in the rear with protection in front of them. And by the way, once um, Esau, because there's this question that was, they, they, why did Esau embrace and kiss him? Some of the sages says Esau was, was actually trying to determine whether or not he had a weapon on him. He, again, I said there's a lot of mixed teachings about Esau and his mindset at this time. But in that culture, one never would accept a gift from an enemy. They would only accept a gift from a friend. And so by him actually accepting these gifts from his brother is an indication that things were being made right between the two of them. I believe that. 
Now, verse 30, I mean, chapter 33, verse 16, um, Esau is going to head out his way. He's asking Jacob to come along. Jacob's saying, no, 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 you go. Um, we can't keep up. And so now we're going to see departing. It says in verse 16 that Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. But then Jacob travels to Sukkot. He built himself a house. He made shelters for his livestock. And therefore, the name of that place is called Sukkot. And Jacob came in peace to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. When he came from Padam Aram and he encamped before the city, he bought the parcel of ground where he spread his tent. And at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, he purchased this land for a hundred pieces of money and he erects an altar there and calls it El Elahi Israel. Huh. Jacob, remember we said twice, twice as many times he's going to be referred to as Jacob than, than Israel. And here might be one of those times. He seems to give the indication to his brother that he will be meeting him in this seer area of Edom. And yet he goes the opposite direction and ends up in Shechem. He's making shelters, a house. Now, the patriarchs usually dwelt in tents. And, and then he's placing himself sort of outside of a major city in that area. Now, all of this to say that there's going to be problems because of these decisions that he's made. And ultimately, Jacob needs to find his way back to where he had that vision at Bethel. But between now and then, lessons still to be learned. Well, chapter 34, um, by the way, this in this chapter, God's name is not mentioned one time. It's one of the most sordid chapters in Israel's history. Uh, it's about Dinah, and um, Simeon and Levi, basically, verse 24, remember Dinah's raped, and the boys come up with the scheme to defend her honor. They're essentially going to wipe out the men of Shechem. Verse 24, it says, all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and Shechem his son and every male this was the plan is that if you want our sister you've got to be circumcised and why don't the whole town get circumcised while you're at it and then on the third day we're told when they were sore I think that's an understatement by the way Simeon and Levi and it says Dinah's brother each took his sword, came upon the unsuspected city, and they wiped out all the males. Okay? And so Jacob's response is kind of twofold. Unfortunately, it seems like he's a little laid back. It's his daughter that was raped. And yet because of uh, the scheming of what the brothers have done, uh, it, it's made... Jacob's situation in living in that area, he says, you've made me a stench, an odor. Uh, we're going to have to be looking over our shoulders every single moment of every single day. People are going to demand retribution and all of this. Look what you've done. And so this is Shechem, and this is what's causing Jacob to have to leave because of this disaster. And again, where does he need to get back to is where God originally wanted him to be, I believe, at Bethel. Well, Andrew Sukamp writes about this, kind of a devotional. He says, um, you know, this idea, uh, verse 22 and 23, it says, Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us, to become one people, when every male among us is circumcised, as they are circumcised, 
Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them, and they will dwell with us. In a sense, the idea was let's absorb Jacob and his sons. And God always wanted a distinction, right? But Andrew writes the Hivites, that's who these people were. They weren't godly people, and therefore they didn't have the ability to seek God's counsel. Had they been different, had they sought God's opinion, maybe they would have been warned of the scheme that was against them. <coughs> we need to be careful when we agree to certain terms that we don't allow our ambition to override our need to bring things in front of the Lord and to seek his counsel and his will. So uh, again, this idea of uh, a kind of what can we glean from this experience? The need to bring things before the Lord and to seek his counsel. Well, we're going to wrap up here. we got a few chapters left. Uh, chapter 35, um, God says to Jacob, arise Go up to Bethel and live there. Make there an altar to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. Then Jacob said to his household and to those who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves. Change your garments. Let's arise. Let's go up to Bethel. I will make there an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me on the way which I went. After 20 years of hard labor with his treacherous uncle Laban, Jacob has now returned safely to the land of Israel. He's been successful in appeasing his brother Esau, and now, despite the mess in Shechem, he's finally made it back to Bethel. The place where, as he set out to leave the land of Israel, this is where he dreamt of that ladder reaching to the heavens. It's now here, 20 years plus later, that he wrecks a pillar in God's name back to where he needed to be. And notice, this is the Jacob that's not winking and nodding his words to all in his household. Put away your foreign gods, the things that, that's that been accumulated on our journey and purify yourselves. It sounds like the same words that Moses gave to the children of Israel as they came to Mount Sinai. I wonder if there's a message there for us. Put away anything that you have that takes the place of God, your foreign gods. Purify yourself. <laughs> Verse 9, God appears to Jacob again when he comes from Padam Aram. He blesses him. And now we get again the name change. Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be Jacob anymore, but your name shall be Israel. And then the promises, and, and we have to understand these promises still are maintained today. They're unconditional. He says, God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations will be from you. Kings will come out of your body. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give to you and to your offspring. After you, I give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he spoke with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he spoke with him, a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering on it. And he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of that place where God spoke to him as Bethel. Yeah, I'm just going to remind you because I'm out of time. I'm almost at 30 minutes, but I, I give myself two extra minutes because of the intro. Is that 
you know, this is that temple zero that we talked about last week. Go back and check that out because now we have a rock pillar oil on it being erected in worship of God. Chapter 35 is the story of Rachel and her death. Uh, you know, Rachel's buried outside of Bethlehem. The sages say she was buried there uh, because um, Jacob had foresaw prophecy of the children of Israel being taken captive to Babylon. And so she's weeping there for their children that are being taken off. But again, for us today, we can see Jacob, uh, Rachel's tomb outside of Bethlehem weeping for her children that are no more of the babes of Bethlehem that Herod slayed. And then we have the, the tale of Reuben and him lying with, his, uh, with Jacob's concubine and losing his right as the firstborn. So we'll wrap up. Um, you'll find in the PDF, uh, I have at the very end, the last slide, something I call Musings from Moshe, my good friend from Shorshim in, the, um, in Jerusalem, in the, in the Jewish center. Uh, just an amazing man that I respect wholeheartedly. I gave you some of his thoughts, his musings on this chapter, and I'll leave you with that. So God bless you and Shalom.